Sorry, I'm actually capturing the room. Just give me a second. Let me just try to refresh. Uh, what do we do at So 
collaborative filtering, after which uh, it's been adopted widely. Uh, and that's how uh, you hear the stories about uh, diapers being bought with beer. I mean, who would think about it? But in, in Target, uh, this is what happened. They, they observed this be behavior where users were purchasing diapers with beer. So they moved the beer uh, car cartons next to diapers to uh, make it a better sale. Uh, and then the item base, as I mentioned before. Nowadays, we also have social base. So you, you want to have a social context, the peer group context. Uh, we all like Scala here, so you might be recommended Scala books, for example. And uh, this, this kind of enhances the type of recommendation uh, possibilities and also the accuracy of ac uh, recommendations. And last but not the least, it's machine learning. So you have uh, various uh, machine learning algorithms that is uh, very popular now, uh, SPD and LDA for uh, uh, recommendation purposes. We'll talk a bit about machine learning as well uh, in the demo. I'll skip this one. OK, what happens in a typical uh, data mining process this is CRISP-DM, which stands for cross-industry standard process for data mining. It's, it's a very fairly uh, a popular methodology for uh, data science. Uh, here it says data mining, but this uh, methodology came in 1996. And uh, so uh, some things uh, get changed, but the methodology doesn't change. So 
when, when you're starting an analytics project, you have to have a business context and a data understanding. And that's the beginning of any process. So you, you try to understand where is the data coming from, what type of data exists, what kind of business uh, environment are you working, and what business problems do you want to solve. And based on this, you would then start the data preparation journey of collecting, massaging, transforming, preparing, uh, the various steps around the data preparation. <coughs> uh, then we move on to modeling, which is the algorithmic modeling uh, based on the data that's prepared. And finally, you evaluate these models against uh, metrics, uh, and you get a prediction score. And then this is an iterative process. Uh, you have to uh, go back and forth before your metrics uh, start to make sense or uh, feed, uh, you have to collect feedback so that uh, the real world scenario meet or matches uh, with the predictions that you're making. So it's a constant loop um, and that's why it's, it's in a circle. So the, the journey never ends. Uh, you're always uh, improving, constantly tuning, constantly uh, preparing and deploying it. Before I move to the next slide, like, how many of you are actually working on Spark? A Spark 1? Spark 2? OK. Um, maybe then I'll just give a quick introduction about Spark. Uh, the, the founder of Scala uh, actually made a provocative statement that Spark is nothing but uh, domain-specific language built on Scala. But, but in theory, it's, it's much more than just uh, DSL on Scala. Uh, we're talking about uh, various uh, algorithms. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like a platform in its own. Uh, it helps data engineering. Uh, it helps uh, machine learning. It helps uh, building graph-based models. Uh, and apart from that, it helps fast computations. So a lot of things have... Uh, come together, what we call a Spark today. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, Spark machine learning pipeline, which was introduced in two. But uh, if you haven't worked on one, then uh, the, the changes in two will not be so relevant. So I'll just straight, straight away go to the changes, or let's say the new things uh, in the Spark machine learning pipeline. What Spark has done is uh, standardized or built a best practice or allowed uh, high-level APIs to build a, a machine learning pipeline that can be um, applied across various use cases. Uh, what it provides is uh, five different pieces in the pipeline, uh, data frame, transformer, estimator, pipeline, parameter. All of these together uh, combined to make a pipeline. Transformer is, transformer is nothing but uh, APIs that allow you to uh, transform your data set. The raw data set that is collected is normally a transactional record or a business record, but machine learning algorithms do not understand these kind of uh, data. And this uh, data has to be transformed into vectors or let's say integers and numbers, basically digits. And Spark provides uh, excellent uh, APIs for these. Then you have the estimators, which are basically the model building blocks. And uh, these model building blocks uh, allow you one to um, yeah, build models out of it. But you can test it. You can uh, have a regression on the, on, the, on the models. At the same time, you can deploy it for uh, uh, use cases. I think I'll give, this is the demo piece. So the demo is going to be based on a, a million song data set from Kaggle. How many of you have heard or are Kaggle members here? OK. So for the non-Kaggle members, uh, Kaggle is currently, uh, it's, it's a data science group. I mean, uh, it's, it's a social network for data science uh, scientists, but bought by Google recently. Uh, it allows you to build um, algorithms, share your algorithms. Companies release uh, 
competitions on this, so you can you can actually test your uh, skills, machine learning skills or predictive analytics skills, and uh, it's a, it's a great uh, collaborative social platform for data science. Just a sec. I'm sorry for the resolution. Uh, is this okay, Hardy? Okay. So, uh, sorry for the resolution. Uh, we had to change the resolution for the display, so I'm, I'm not good with uh, managing resolutions. So what I've used is a uh, Zeppelin notebook. Uh, Zeppelin is a notebook that's uh, open source. Uh, it, it falls into the category of uh, Jupyter notebooks. How many of you are familiar with these technologies? Okay, I see always this side of the section. Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, Zeppelin is amazing. I would uh, recommend all of you to try it out. It's one of my favorite tools because uh, it allows you to run Scala. It allows you to run AngularJS. It allows you to run Markdown. It kind of can run any kind of backend engine. You can quickly test, prototype, uh, at the same time build amazing uh, reports out of it. Uh, so uh, highly, highly recommended recommend product. product. Uh, which we have been uh, uh, using in our team. So as I was uh, explaining on uh, collaborative filtering, uh, this, there are two types of collaborative filters, uh, explicit uh, feedback system and an implicit feedback system. So with explicit, we are, we are expecting users to make explicit uh, or provide us information uh, explicitly, which means that user either ticks on a, on an, or let's say rates a product, or says or likes a product, or gives a thumbs up or thumbs down to the product. And an implicit feedback doesn't have this, and which makes it uh, more challenging to recommend a product, because you don't have any information from the user to know what that person likes. So for this uh, example, I've used a million song data set, which is on uh, Kaggle. Later, we'll uh, put this on GitHub as, as a link as well so that you could uh, uh, try out this notebook. And uh, in, in this uh, example, we'll be using the alternative, alternating least squares uh, uh, algorithm to make recommendations. So what typically happens is uh, in a user item kind of a matrix, you don't always have the um, user input for all the items or uh, user uh, feedback for all the items. Well, that's why you have something called like a sparse matrix. And it's very difficult to make uh, algorithms or build algorithms on uh, sparse matrix. And with ALS, it's a very interesting concept. It's, 
it's basically matrix uh, multiplication. So you divide it into two matrices, one of users and the second one is for items. And then based on uh, alternating least squares principle, you start slowly filling the gaps or the uh, deltas in these matrices, which gives you an approximate, so it's, it's, this is why it's called predictive or let's say uh, machine learning, because it gives you approximate uh, user uh, preferences. Uh, with Spark, it's very easy. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll show you how you can build. Unfortunately, I cannot just see the full screen. Just give me a second. Sorry, can you elaborate on how these matrices are built? This one? In what way? How do you come up with the resulting two matrices from the Right. So you take any of these uh, inputs with an existing uh, user and item recommendation, and you use the ALS algorithm to slowly start filling each of these points, which gives you a user versus uh, item preference, but it's, again, approximate. Okay, so it's a black box algorithm that you're not going to No. That's, that's the intention of the meetup so that we, and I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> but anyways, uh, it's, it's a black box, ALS. We feed uh, parameters into this, and then you get uh, items out of it. Hope you can still see the screen. Okay, here this is uh, simple Scala uh, imports of the Spark library. Uh, we've just uh, imported the Spark library for the ALS. Uh, as I showed in the presentation, this is the the ALS model, so this is the estimator that we are going to just build by providing the user ID, the song ID, and the place as the uh, three columns of that matrix. Uh, and with, it, uh, with Zeppelin, it's uh, very, very interesting because it just maintains the context, so you can, you can run. So now I have uh, access to ALS for further uh, processing. I already have uh, the songs uh, list, which is basically a unique ID of a song and the uh, song ID for that, the song that was played. So all of this has already been uh, anonymized uh, and built into, uh, uh, let's say, data set that's already ready for uh, building algorithms. Uh, similarly, uh, for users, uh, and the interesting thing here is that you can get the data from any source. So you can have it on Hadoop, you can have it on S3, you can have it on various data sources, and Zeppelin is uh, able to connect to it. And uh, you, can, you can build or uh, work on that data uh, interactively. So here again, uh, we are preparing the uh, a data set. So three data set songs, uh, the place, and the, the user song play matrix by uh, preparing the data frame around it. Once, once you have the data frame, you can go into uh, model training. Model training is fairly simple. Uh, you split your model, yeah? The data frame is not as fast as right? Sorry? The data frame is not a sparse No. Just, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For uh, typical uh, predictive model testing, we just have to have a test data, and then you need to, you need to have a training data, and then you have a test data. So we are going to split it uh, onto training and test uh, using this simple function again. And the reason I'm showing this is that 
it's very easy to build your own algorithms or machine learning pipelines. Uh, in the course of, let's say, one or two hours, you can quickly test if you have the data sets. Um, and <clears throat> Spark provides a lot of rich algorithms to uh, play around. Once, once we have the training data set, we train the model. So we have this ALS, the black box. We say, OK, take this data, and then give me the predictions, which I will test against the test data. So now it's, it's running. It'll take some time uh, to complete. It's, uh, it's a VM with um, 8 gig memory and 2 core uh, CPU. Takes about a minute on my machine, if I'm not wrong. It's, it's an iterative process. So every time, uh, it's calculating the missing pieces of the uh, matrix. Once the model is ready, uh, you would use the transform to make your predictions. Uh, it's uh, as simple as that. You would use a model.transform. Again, this is coming from Spark. All of this is a Spark API. So you connect the data, you prepare the data, you use a machine learning algorithm from Spark, uh, train your uh, model against the test data, and then test or validate or cross-validate that uh, against the predicted results. Let me see. OK, it completed in about a minute, 20 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> and then you're going to get an RMSE score, which is root mean square error. But this is, this is kind of like a, a, a benchmark to validate or test your models. Uh, how bad or how good are these models? A lower number of RMA, RMSE is, is better. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, hyper-tuning or tuning these models for better performance or uh, benchmarking. But this is just a demo to show how simple it is to build a model on Spark uh, using Zeppelin. I'll let it run and <clears throat> come back when it's finished. It's run out of power, I guess. Hello? OK. Tien, uh, do you know? A virtual box, how to come out of the full screen mode. I think, th does anyone know how to get out of the virtual box full screen mode? <laughs> Technical problem. You need to hit right click to get to the Yeah, I tried the control H right click, but.
So that was a quick uh, demo on how you could build a model and train uh, ALS algorithms on a data set. So is that the end of it? Like what happens after you build the model, right? I mean, a typical uh, example is that you want to uh, <clears throat> recommend uh, products on an app. Your data scientist will build a model and then how do you actually make those recommendations, right? That's, that's the biggest problem that most companies face. Uh, not, not in building models or not in testing models, but how do you deploy it in production? Because <clears throat> after prototyping, uh, the challenges are always the same. How do you scale it? How do you uh, distribute it? Uh, how do you make sure it works in a distributed environment? How can you make sure the different components are uh, talking to each other? Uh, how do we make sure the separation of con concerns uh, are maintained so that if your recommendation engine goes down, the whole app doesn't go down? Uh, these are the challenges that a typical architect or a typical system uh, engineering team would face because the models uh, are good but not sufficient to uh, make the recommendations. Because uh, uh, in reality, the machine learning workflow uh, looks like this. Uh, you have data that's coming in from different sources, uh, streaming as well as um, uh, data sources. Then you ingest it, <coughs> either using Spark or Kafka or uh, various... Uh, systems. We do processing. Uh, data processing, again, could be a, a Spark. And then you would do the model training, as I just showed you on Zeppelin. You would do model training. And that's when uh, it stops, because you build these models. Uh, everything is ready. The data scientist says, OK, here is the model. But how do you move it into production? How does your front end or your client-specific applications receive it? Uh, the deployment and going live is, is always a challenge. And then you need to also have a feedback loop because, it, as I said before, the uh, user preferences keep changing. Uh, the uh, recommendations can be improved based on the user preferences. So if you recommend a product and if the user doesn't, or let's say the users don't react according to these recommendations, you need to make changes so that the newer recommendations can uh, come in. So all of these factors um, make it difficult to move recommendation algorithms or uh, machine learning algorithms into production. What, what I'm going to show next are <clears throat> two solutions uh, that we believe uh, help moving uh, production or like say productionizing algorithms. Uh, one is prediction IO. Uh, this uh, is, is still an open source project, but recently bought by Salesforce. What prediction IO does is that it is built uh, prediction <clears throat> APIs on Spark and HBase and Elasticsearch, I believe. But you can also have different backends uh, to do the different pieces of um, modeling. So it, it, it also provides a rich uh, ecosystem, as well as a standard API to build a pipeline. And it allows you, as, as you can see here, there are two servers. One, one is where you deploy a model. So you could train it in Spark. You could train it in different uh, uh, machine learning algorithms or systems but you could deploy it on production IO. At the same time, you receive the feedback from the users in the same system, which makes it very convenient for users to, um, or let's say, not users, for companies to move uh, things into production. And the second one is fairly new. Clipper is, uh, I think, uh, not much talked about because it's coming out of a university. Uh, and, and their vision is to kind of be the um, middleman, because today we talk about TensorFlow, we talk about various algorithms and various, let's say, uh, groups. Uh, some, some people prefer Scala, some people, some uh, folks would say we, we develop only in Python or Java. Uh, and similarly, in machine learning, there, is, there, are, there are, let's say, fractions or factions of uh, popularity like Spark, TensorFlow, Cafe. All of these are uh, machine learning um, libraries. But what uh, Clipper does, it provides an abstraction where you could deploy these models, at the same time receive uh, events from these different applications. So it, it helps to build the pipeline uh, and making uh, this workflow a reality by bridging the gaps of deployment and uh, live systems. There are many more, but these two are, these two are quite uh, interesting, uh, according to me.
so that was uh, in in short uh, an introduction to recommendation systems with uh, Spark and Scala. But uh, <clears throat> as this slide says, sometimes it's not always about algorithms or, uh, or data because without without the right data, you're not going to be making recommendations on intuition and uh, one needs to pay attention to that. Uh, I won't stop with the Dilbert, but this is how you can improve it. I mean, <clears throat> to add uh, or make the recommendation system more uh, robust, you would add serendipity to it. When, when, we, when I say serendipity, it's like you're kind of uh, making a random recommendation uh, which has not been done before and just test it out and see if users uh, like it. It's a, it's a product that's never been recommended to that person and you would say, okay, let's test it out. So that you just make sure there's not a bias effect because that's one of the challenges of um, a recommendation system that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you keep uh, recommending the popular products and the popular products get bought more and then it's a constant loop. So you to break that monotony or break that bias, you would in introduce this uh, concept of serendipity. Uh, remember that it is temporal, so recommendation engines uh, are not something that you deploy and forget. It has to be constantly tuned, checked, uh, feedback has to be captured. Um, you have to perform A-B tests because two models might uh, perform differently, so make sure that the systems have the opportunity to have A-B testing uh, in life. And last but not the least, uh, yeah, have feedback into your uh, system. So that, that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And uh, you can reach me at, uh, on Twitter, or you can email me uh, at this email address. Yes. Question, Question number one. Uh, with initial tra training, how much data do you use for cross-validation set and for test set in percentage, roughly? From your Se 70, 30. Normally, okay. yeah, normally the, the split is 70 30. How much data is very subjective? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. I must <laughs> uh, whatever data we, we can get, uh, how much of a historical data we can get, uh, it's good because then your system can be more robust. Uh, but one to two years of data uh, is, is a good uh, measure to make uh, robust uh, recommendations, build better models. And 70 30, 80 20 is quite a good one. And second question, uh, do you take into account the parameters which doesn't belong directly to the item, like moon phase or whether, you know, it can yes. affect the yes. choice of user yes. when it picks the, uh, he or she picks the music, let's say, or movies especially. Yes. It's information from IMDB. Correct. They try to do this, but I don't know the result. Uh, do you use this or something which is not directly relevant <coughs> to the item? Uh, I would say so because that was the first one I was uh, talking about, hybrid and context. Mm -hmm. People are trying to make more and more sophisticated models, like uh, they're trying to observe the mood of the person, uh, they're trying to observe uh, what type of uh, environment they stay, like uh, housing, everything. That's, that's why data is so important, data is uh, money. Uh, they try to collect as much information about a person to feed into these kind of uh, systems because the better data that you have, or more data you have, uh, better recommendation systems or better algorithmic models can be built out of it. So yes, I would I would recommend uh, taking those uh, parameters into it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, my name is Goran. So my question is, to, how do you effectively test the performance of one recommendation system, or whether there is some kind of benchmark? There are two stages to this. One is before you move it into production. Uh, so that's when uh, cross-validation and hyper-tuning and all those things will come into picture. And the second one is uh, actually capturing it from live systems. So as I said, events based on user uh, responses to the recommendations and then feeding it back to the system. So both of these play a critical role. Uh, to answer the question. Why do you use here Scala? Why not Python? As I said, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult question to answer. So actually, I wanted to start the talk by saying that uh, I'm not here to preach Scala or Python or this is better than the other. Uh, it's, it's a preference. But 
to be fair enough, I mean, Sc Spark is built on Scala. And Spark is such a rich, rich ecosystem for uh, big data analytics, big data engineering, big data, you know, ana analytics. Uh, it just makes it far simpler to use uh, Scala. And once you start using Scala, you, you realize how rich the ecosystem is. You can, you can uh, uh, rely on the Java ecosystem as well whenever uh, there's a lack of support, a lack of library. So you can execute Java code as well. So uh, these are the pros. Uh, and the cons is that some, some of the algorithms are more mature in uh, R or Python or uh, the other libraries. So it's, it's a very uh, difficult question to answer. And that's why the industry is trying to make sure that uh, no one group is left out. All, all the uh, users get uh, s support by having these uh, uh, intermediate solutions that can talk to each other. Is there any library only on Scala and not implemented on Python? No. No. So in Python, we have the same functionality in Scala. Correct. Uh, but the performance in Scala is, is much better. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's going to run on JVM. It's uh, Java Virtual Machine has been there for the last 25, 30 years. Uh, it's been tested, proven everywhere. And it's, the speed is just going to be much, much better because it's a compiled code versus Python. So uh, when we use data frames, uh, the should be the same? I think that if, if your question is specifically about Spark, is it specifically about Spark? So if it's, if it's about Spark, then uh, <clears throat> Spark 2 is the answer to that. Uh, previously in Spark 1.0 versions, Scala was uh, better performing. So any, let's say, API that you would use uh, on, sp on Spark, Scala would perform better compared to PySpark. But with uh, Spark 2, what they've done is they've uh, uh, provided new APIs. Uh, they've removed the concept of RDDs which allows similar kind of performance on Python, R, and Scala. So they're trying to provide similar performance on all, all these languages on Spark. With Spark 2, you would get similar performance. Yes. So you mentioned this uh, production system, so yeah. platform to run your uh, models. <coughs> did you use them for your own cases, or did you load something else? What, what we are doing is we are building, <coughs> uh, so Kubita, Kubita platform actually is this end-to-end -end pipeline. So we have uh, built a platform that has abstracted this into one big black box, and our customers normally use it for building vertical apps on it. So, so the productionizing or time to market is faster. So then, then I guess you write some, uh, a lot of, Report and Scala, this is where Scala is also. Because in the demo that you showed, it's really just. Yeah, the demo was just. Yeah, correct. Uh, what we use Scala primarily is for uh, <coughs> uh, back end. So we use Akka. Uh, we do a lot of uh, distributed uh, computing work. So we use Kafka primarily, and that's, that's, uh, we have a back end that allows communication to happen using Akka. Uh, and secondly, we have Spark Jobs. Uh, which process terabytes of data. Uh, so we have a strong uh, application built in Spark to handle these kind of jobs, as well as in the future we'll be building a machine learning pipeline, again, completely on uh, Scala. So as a follow-up question then, um, so what is your model of uh, running uh, as part of context? Because uh, I remember when I was dealing with that, there was this issue that uh, have on the one Spark context with JVM, and if you have this kind of a long-running thing that uh, uh, can answer online queries, which Spark is not really suited for, but, but still, it's kind of tricky. So how do you go around? Yeah, I guess we, we still have this issue. Uh, we have to have multiple uh, Spark jobs for that. But <clears throat> there are some solutions out there. So we are exploring uh, Levy, the REST, REST interface to Spark jobs. So that allows you to have a REST uh, RPC kind of a procedure called to Spark. And with Spark 2.0, we have uh, better APIs to manage the data frames as well. So you don't really have to build a Spark submit or a Spark application, but you could uh, literally use a play framework uh, to build your application context, and you could have multiple contexts running at the same time. But to your request, so for example, if you have a, a uh, you want 
I recommend something on the website. So you have this request for the product page, and you want to serve a list of uh, recommendations on that page. So this request, will it hit Spark, or will it hit some other database that uh, Spark yeah. The, the actual interface or let's say the final <coughs> predicted outputs would not be on Spark. Uh, it would be on another persistent store. We use Elasticsearch. Uh, we could use any other uh, in-memory uh, system, uh, for example, uh, from where uh, the recommendations will actually go out. So the application that is uh, querying for recommendations uh, would not directly interact with Spark. Uh, that's how we have designed the system. So Spark processing is a batch processing. In a way, yes. I mean, it is batch processing because we are doing offline analytics on the uh, historical data. We also want to do uh, Spark streaming, which is where I think the real-time interaction will come. But even then, it is, it is either going to be a Kafka topic or uh, Elasticsearch. But we will not be using Spark as the uh, interface to the uh, application uh, layer. A series, uh, series of Spark batch jobs. Yeah. Do you use something to monitor them to manage to schedule different jobs or to restart the old jobs? <laughs> our, our team is smiling here because this is this is uh, exactly what we we have done. Uh, so we have a monitoring service in the platform uh, that monitors uh, the the jobs, the ongoing Spark jobs. Uh, we can kill them. We can schedule them. Some internal, <coughs> internal tool. Yeah, we, we had to build it. So we use Scala to build it. Uh, and uh, so we, we have built our own custom solution to monitor as well as uh, uh, the architecture is completely decoupled from uh, each of the uh, modules. Uh, so we use uh, Kafka mainly to decouple all the uh, systems. Uh, and we use Kafka again to even monitor as well as uh, break or schedule or cancel these uh, Spark jobs. Yeah. Uh, could you, could you describe briefly your infrastructure, uh, server infrastructure, and how you did you solve any performance issue? Do you have any optimization uh, settings or something? Like I mean, we started this journey three years ago. How big uh, your infrastructure? Okay, we have deployed in customers like 20, 30, 40, 50 nodes. So we have customers that is running in 30, 30 nodes on AWS, for example. So the architecture. Uh, and, and our journey started three years ago when we started building uh, what we call Kubera today. We started three years ago. So we have gone through a lot of iterations, a lot of pain. Uh, in uh, making sure things work in production. So when uh, most of the times we had to face uh, troubles with Spark. Uh, but what, what we have done is uh, the, the biggest learning for us has been decoupling. Uh, previously, what we used to do is have a very tight coupling to make the development faster. Uh, today, we uh, really explore Kafka for a lot of our use cases because what we are trying to do is uh, actor model kind of a development environment. So all our backend is based on Akka where you're just sending messages for jobs for various use cases, which are then picked up by different actors and again processed, and then we receive it over a Kafka channel. And this has helped us to scale. I mean, uh, LinkedIn ran, or LinkedIn developed Kafka, and it, it ran on, I guess, a uh, few 10,000 nodes uh, of clusters. So we, we are very uh, dependent on Kafka and uh, decoupling for scaling. Please, please. Sorry. Uh, do you currently use uh, machine learning libraries provided by Spark ML, or do you only use machine learning libraries? Uh, we have both. Uh, we have both. So we have a data science team. Uh, we also partner with few uh, data science uh, team. Uh, we are actually uh, a company that's headquartered in Switzerland. Uh, the parent group is headquartered in Switzerland. So we have a lot of. Uh, uh, data science teams working with us. At the same time, we build our own models for customers and use existing Spark libraries. So, so the model is, is already written in Scala, so you can just... Yeah, the one that I just showed, it's a black box. You can, you can throw in, uh, let's say, the parameters of the data to it. But 
to get the best result out of it, you need to use hyper, you know, like parameters tuning or hyper tuning of your parameters. Uh, else, the performance wouldn't be optimal, and that's that comes only with experience. Uh, because black boxes will exist. I mean, as you said, you can you can push something into it, but to really understand the performance or the optimal performance, you one needs to have experience, context, uh, everything. To incorporate new data uh, for the recommendations, you have to run uh, in your system. You have to run all this pipeline again from scratch, or is there some way to take some kind of uh, update of the data and use that? Uh, if you see here, like there are two kinds of feedbacks uh, that go into it. So one is into historical data, uh, one is into the algorithmic layer. So it's already bypassing the historical. So typically, what happens when you build uh, these kind of systems, uh, you'll have an offline and a real time, uh, the Lambda architecture. And you would want to use both uh, to provide the best recommendations possible because uh, you need to capture the events, uh, which means your model can be uh, trained on live feedback. Uh, normally, you wouldn't retrain your model. What you would do is you would change your weights in the model. So you, you'll have weights, and these weights would be changed. If you have neural networks, you'll have your weights changed. Uh, before, just before deployment, so that you don't have to constantly tweak. And then, if if the let's say the performance is not so good, uh, then you would come back and then go back to the data scientists and say, okay, we need newer models, or can we do the analytics again on new data? Uh, mainly for analytics, we use uh, MongoDB for persistence. Uh, we use uh, we have a very, uh, let's say, uh, many different storage systems in our um, uh, platform. So we use Postgres, we use MongoDB, we use Elasticsearch, we use Hive, uh, we use we want to use HBase. No, Elasticsearch is the event store because you would you would want uh, it to be. Um, Fast, uh, MongoDB would not give you the performance. What the structure like? It's a JSON. JSON. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, all all the uh, output is a JSON. So on that, uh, so let's say if you are doing collaborative filtering on user user recommendation. So in those cases, you would need to compute real-time real similarity between the users. So how do you deal with that? Uh, or is it all primarily on batch to decompose? When you want to have a JSON transformation or JSON uh, computation in real time, uh, then you need to have an intermediate cache or an intermediate computation engine. Uh, in between your analytics layer and your application layer. Uh, else you would be relying on Spark. What we are exploring is how we can use Spark streaming as one option for uh, these kind of real time. Because Spark provides excellent JSON libraries, right? I mean, we don't need to, uh, uh, let's say, reinvent the wheel. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Uh, how, how do you perceive the offset of the Kafka data? So, when you streaming and if you want to change the, 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 the algorithm of the Yeah, yeah. For, for that, we, we haven't yet explored that. What we are thinking of is ACA persistence so that we can store these offsets uh, using an ACA persistence uh, layer. We haven't yet developed that. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Any more? Okay. Thank you.